of uh, speakers and teachers. So it is my uh, sort of debut with uh, Sri Harsha. And I must congratulate the team, including you, uh, Sri Harsha. Sorry, I'm for debut with uh, Sahasra ENT Foundation. So it's uh, really an honor to be this, and I hope. Uh, I could, I can uh, keep up the tradition of the teaching that you have uh, initially that you started. And so, without much delay, let's go to the topic of the day. Uh, Shri Harsha? Yes, sir. Uh, your screen is... Uh, this uh, window is there. How do I just move it away? You can move it. It's coming right on the text of my... You can just drag it to, to the other end of the screen. Ah, okay, okay. Fine. Yeah, so... <clears throat> it's 7.35 now. <clears throat> So, uh, welcome, good evening, and welcome to all those <coughs> students uh, who are here as part of the first, I, I believe, the first talk of the Larynx and Airway session. So, we'll uh, begin with a very uh, important aspect of uh, larynx, which is the physiology of voice and speech. Although speech goes beyond the larynx, but the remit of today's topic is actually physiology of voice and speech. Uh, uh, greetings to all of you from uh, I thank the uh, organizers for inviting me for this particular session of which I must say I'm very fond of. I am part of the Laringology team and physiology is something that I really like. So the uh, specific learning objectives of this session are on these uh, vocal fold anatomy in brief. Although the talk on physiology, we cannot really have physiology without anatomy at all. So in brief, uh, I'm assuming here that the basic anatomy of larynx has been either taken or all the all those attending are aware of that. So I'll be touching basically on vocal fold anatomy by itself. Vocal fold physiology, of course, in detail, because physiology of speech productions, and very briefly, uh, voice disorder. So what I've planned is each segment or each slide where there's a specific aspect of physiology uh, i've added something in red font which speaks about the which talks about the uh, change that would happen in that physiology which indicates the pathology and also at the end i've clubbed a few uh, disorders together but it's overall very brief because that would be out of the limit of this talk so these are all the specific learning objectives i hope i'll be, I'll be able to achieve all of these at the end of this session of about one hour yeah, uh, so speech, as we know, is uh, not just about larynx. It's a process of a combination of phonation, resonance, and articulation. And I in different colors and just to give the effect of a, like a rainbow. You know? So speech is such a wonderful phenomenon. It's like a rainbow-like effect of all of these uh, colorful uh, processes coming together to uh, create the wonderful uh, human faculty that is our speech. So phonation, resonance, articulation. So if you talk, if you were to talk only of larynx, it would be only phonation. But talk speech also, so the other things also will be coming in this uh, speech talk. Uh, phonation has been described as a physical act of sound production by means of passive vocal phone in interaction with the exhaled air stream. Just a uh, formal sort of definition. So I'm to we always say to begin at the beginning. So to begin at the beginning, I'm talking, starting off with the neurophysiology of phonation. So when we say neurophysiology, the neurology part, and we know where that begins. Yeah, so these are all, what I'm showing this picture is a different form of 
human uh, and there is an animal also in it human communication so we we voice we phonate we we voice we talk we speak and we also cry we laugh there are so many of these things all of which involves uh, voicing to a certain degree from very minimum to very complex so those are the, all the various forms and the importance in neurophysiology is that each of these when we do a different part of the uh, activated yeah so this is where it all starts that is the here right here the motor homunculus uh, on the primary cortex of the left cerebral hemisphere right so this is all actually uh, first year physiology that is the area which provides the motor supply so that, that this is where the the sort of the switch gets switched on and the wire starts buzzing and coming down to the affected organs that is in our case the larynx so this is the first place and then this are some of the areas we showing a separate table what i'm trying to convey here is that even in that area different areas are activated for different types of uh, voicing and speech so it's when we are when there's a normal conversation a different area when we are happy and laughing or sad and crying all different area is activated there is also of course the extra pineal system which is also involved and uh, some areas like substantia nigra as increasingly under focus uh, for condition like spasmodic dystonia so all these other uh, areas of where the neurophysiology is. yeah so those are some of the specific areas of course this is just uh, uh, sort of just the uh, very briefly touching on it because it's not uh, really a neurology session so but still just keep in mind so that the limbic system in general is the most vocal area so when we say is the main area for speak most of the time is the limbic system then if you are you know, down depressed and expressing emotions in that way the periacritical gray and the amygdala come into uh, gets activated then in amygdala itself medial and lateral separately for one extreme of joy other extreme of fear so amygdala then the neolimbic cingulate gyrus is for a wide range of complex social emo emotional vocalization so we are in all active discussions there are a lot of activities happening then this area would come into play so this is just in brief about the specific areas in the brain the limbic system the very acrylic gray the amygdala and the cingulate gyrus so these are all the, you know, where the different switches are placed depending on what they are trying to convey in our communication so uh, yeah so this is the uh, thing in red associated uh, applied physiology that is neurological condi conditions affecting these areas the you would have varying type of speech disorders not necessarily hoarseness so this is something i will be repeating again and again that when we say hoarseness we think of dysphonia which is essentially a problem in our larynx the voice box but when you say speech disorders that's an entire huge spectrum of which hoarseness is one part so any problem in these areas any neurological conditions you have different different types of speech disorders okay so uh, once the switch is pressed what things happen so first is the voluntary cortical control that is we decide in our mind you know, we want to speak so now i have decided that i want to speak so the switch is about to be pressed on so the first is the pre phonatory tuning then is the basic tonic volitional contractions maintenance of length tension bulk and position of the effector muscles as the vocal folds so these are of, obviously these are the normal motor uh, physiology the arc from the uh, brain to the effector muscles and then you have the stimulation of angle mechano mechanoreceptors now there is an interesting thing i want to focus on the word mechanoreceptors especially the word the aspect mechano so it conveys or it should convey the concept of mechanical and what does that convey so the volitional part the voluntary part is over now once the larynx has come into play after a certain uh, step it becomes mechanical so stabilization of return of vocal folds a prefunitary pattern is mechanical we'll of course this in great detail and then the phonatory modulations is supposed to be subcortical with extra pyramidal inputs and of course as we have seen the amygdala all those would come into play depending on what exactly we are trying to say and convey in our speech so this is the sort of just the basic steps from the 
bring to the larynx. Now again, this is again this is all uh, should be obvious things, but I just want to put it in black and white, so to say. So you have taken the decision to vocalize from wherever it is. So cortex to the basal ganglia influence the brain electrical signal passes. Uh, again, I'm at the risk of repeating myself, I'm saying the switch is pressed on the signals pass through brainstem and to the main wire that is the vagus and then the two branches of those wire the recurrent and superior laryngeal nerves which the next part again is basic physiology or first year physiology that there is a release of neurotransmitter acetylcholine is a neuromuscular junction muscle receptors intrinsic laryngeal muscle and the muscle contraction this then causes the vocal fold movements and initiation of formation uh, again this all must be very obvious the uh, uh, should I click approve for this? No, sir. No, no. Some. Oops. I think it took off. Could you just? Uh, I think I by mistake I pressed approve. Is it? I mean, can you just? No, no. You can ignore, sir. Okay. But that thing is. Uh, sorry, click to approve. Sorry. Okay. Fine. So. Uh, so uh, why I've still put it all up on the slide is that just for you to understand that something going wrong in the physiology in the function of each step will lead to a different sort of problem. And that is so essential to the uh, diagnosis and management of that particular problem. These are the breakdown of the steps. OK, just a little bit of uh, the uh, neuroanatomy here little bit uh, again the reason for that i'll just show when you talk about the applied physiology so uh superior laryngeal branch and inferior so some say inferior and we popularly say recurrent i suppose superior inferior is easier to remember but inferior is the same as recurrent now recurrent laryngeal branch has the divides then after entering the larynx uh, divides into anterior and posterior branches in general, the anterior is the adductor branch, supposed to be a posterior is the abductor branch. Sort of, I've sort of proven this. But the next part, what I've underlined is something that you all must understand very, uh, very deeply and thoroughly: the fact that there's a wide variability of the branchings to the individual muscle. So the differing patterns of specific muscle innervation has been proven. Now this is a key to understanding the concept of what happens when there is a dysfunction of recurrent laryngeal nerve, which we say as RLN palsy or paresis, and translates to diagnosis as a vocal fold palsy or paresis. So they say that there is the new concept is such, uh, if you remember your old, I mean, it's still in our books, at least the UG books, you have this concept of the uh, position of vocal cord as uh, median, cadaveric, uh, lateral, all that. So those are not really uh, correct. There is no such thing as a complete vocal fold palsy. So some branch would probably still be firing, some branch would be totally gone, and this is unpredictable. And that explains why you can't really predict how a policy evolves over the uh, few months. Okay, so something very important. So this is a major factor of recovery from policy. The concept of differential, uh, varying differential uh, nerve supply, and the concept of the recovery and synkinesis. And therefore, in pre procedure planning. Okay. So this is something just keep in mind very nicely. So you can't really predict. So it could be in, in a given case, it could be the posterior. They started to recover. In some other, the posterior is not, is not recovering. So it, it's variable. So just something I wanted to stress on. <laughs> yeah, continuing uh, with a little bit of anatomy here, recurrent or the inferior laryngeal nerve, as you all know very well, supplies all the intrinsic muscles except the cricothyroid. Uh, we'll see a lot of short forms. This is just something I'm generally discouraging PGs, but this is just to prevent crowding of the slide, so please excuse that. Uh, so, CT is the cricothyroid muscle, which as you all know is supplied by the, the superlaryngeal nerve. Uh, all the other muscles have an ipsilateral supply except the unpaired. So, at the back, you know, there's the interarytenoid, and that is supplied by both sides of the recurrent laryngeal. And the next thing is so important, the fact that there is a very high innervation ratio for human laryngeal muscle. There is a 100 to 200 cells per motor unit. This is very high compared to other muscles also and compared to laryngeal muscles of other animals also. So that you can see the importance given to the human uh, voice box. So all this high 
uh, innovation ratio allows for high precision for rapid adjustment. Uh, just a quick view of the uh, specific uh, actions. So when we say adduction, the first muscle that we tend to think of is the lateral cricoarachnoid. So please remember when the lateral cricoarachnoid contracts, it actually pulls away the muscular processes and brings together the vocal processes, which then brings the vocal ligament, the vocal folds together, which we call as adduction. So adduction of vocal folds this happens this way. Just keep this in mind. The muscular, it's it's sort of the swing action, muscular we vocal together. And after this happens, you play the transverse, the muscle of the back transverse and interarachnoids pull it further together. And then you have the thyroid and vocal, which are the muscles, uh, fibers inside the vocal fold. Okay. Then they contract and bring about the further changes which are needed for the actual fine tuning of our speech. So first step, the adduction by LCA and then these muscles for the uh, fine tuning. We'll be seeing more of these. These are just diagrammatic preparation. And of course, the this muscle is so important. Uh, it's called as a lifesaver muscle, but not a part of phonation per se, the posterior gracoarytenoids, which are the, is the only abductor. But here what happens, just uh, keep in mind that the muscular processes are pulled together and the reverse way, the swing action, the vocal processes are moved apart. And so the posterior glottis especially opens wide to let in the air for us to inhale. This is abduction. Just a quick, I hope the video plays. Just have a look. Yeah, it's playing. This is the lateral cricoarytenoids. We saw that as we just saw the muscular process moving away, the vocal process coming together and you have the adduction happening. And just focus on this. In the adducted, uh, I just, why I chose these two is that adduction has happened and now just see after adduction when we speak, see what happens, thyroarytenoid. It's, it's adducted and then those the muscles inside are contracting, pumping and creating a particular effect which we'll see very, with much more detail. Yeah, this is something again I, which I uh, want you all to uh, focus on. Mm. By the way, this name below, you can note down the names also. This is a, a good reference source, especially there is actually uh, Clarence Isaac, he's done a lot of work on physiology of larynx. There's actually an entire book by him, which I could not get actually this from Ballinger. So uh, these are the specific effects of actions of the inter, uh, intensive laryngeal muscles in vocal fold changes. Okay. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll sort of settle with the easiest one first, that is the PCA, which is not part of uh, voice of phonation, the posterior cricoarytenoid. What does it do? We all know it's abductor, we've already seen, but also remember when it abducts the vocal fold, it also pulls it up. So, it, uh, uh, just to guide you all, what you're seeing in bold is the strong action of the muscles, and what you're seeing in italics is the mild action. Okay, so which means when the PCA contract, it not only, of course, fully abducts the vocal folds, it also strongly elevates and elongates the vocal folds. Okay, just to remind you all, this is. This does not help or does not contribute to phonation, but just to keep that in mind. Now we come straight to this side. Uh, the LCA, as I said first, it adducts and also remember it lowers to a certain extent. So the main two actions of the lateral carotenoid, we know it's adductor, but also lowers to a certain extent. Okay. Uh, uh, just just adduction only, it very, very mildly shortens the and slacken, that's okay. Now come to the vocalis and thyroid Vocalis, we generally refer to the vocalis, which is the uh, more fine tuning muscle, but thyroid vocalis, you can take it as one set. Now, what does this do? Just look at all the strong actions. It adducts, of course, which is all done by the LCA. It shortens the uh, vocal fold, the length. As if you remember the previous video, actually, you would have noticed that uh, it thickens and blunts the vocal folds and stiffens the muscle. Of course, muscle naturally has to stiffen because the vocalis itself the muscle, so that gets stiffened. But these two things, remember, that the length gets shortened and the uh, thickness, it thickens, and which blunts it. I just quickly going back to this, you can just observe it again here, the thickening and the blunting. So that thickening and blunting. So this is important, remember. Why is it important, remember? Because each effect on the vocal fold is useful or necessary to create a certain 
effect on the voice in terms of the parameters of voice, which we'll see in due course. So uh, this is something that we uh, should be imprinted in your mind. What do these muscles do? So the vocalis adducts, of course, you'll know that, but also remember that it shortens the length, thickens and blunts the uh, vocal fold edge. Okay? Now coming to the cricothyroid. Now cricothyroid, as we say, is is the it's, it's intrinsic muscle of larynx taken as intrinsic muscle but it's outside the uh, the structure and what does it do again look at all the things it doesn't have much effect on the position that is it's neither adducts fully nor abducts so it keeps in paramedian but look at all the other action it elongates the vocal fold it thins sharpens and stiffens so it basically if you just see those words and imagine close your eyes and imagine you can see it causes a knife like effect it makes the vocal uh, fold like a knife okay? and this if you just visualize what happens if you remember the nerve supply so when the recurrent laryngeal nerve is not functioning so the first column second column third column fourth column all those muscles are out of action so the only muscle that's acting is the cricothyroid and what does it do it keeps the uh, vocal fold in the paramedian position but also makes it stressed and knife like and now imagine both sides getting paralyzed when both are going to get paralyzed so this thing is happening on both sides which means you have a absolutely stiff stressed uh, unmoving uh, vocal folds which has a potential for life threatening strider so keep that in mind so this is something that you all should uh, really have an understanding of each muscle the specific Actions apart from the what we know as abductors and adductors, okay. Uh, there is something more also in terms of body and cover, which I'll be coming to in subsequent step. Yeah, now the next thing this is something again, this is strictly speaking, you can say it's micro anatomy, but so important for physiology. The whole physiology of the vocal folds and larynx changed with the with this picture, you can say uh, this is uh, a picture where my. I could say my favorite picture as a laryngologist, as a voice person, especially the person who of physiology, this is my sort of favorite picture. And why is that? This Hirano's discovery of this concept of body cover sort of revolutionized the concept of uh, voice and vocal fold uh, functioning. So what is the body? The body is very simply what you're seeing in red here, that is the muscle, whether you call thyroid, thyroid, vocalis, that's okay. The entire thing together, along with the uh, deep layer, is the of the lamina propria is the body of the vocal fold and right on top is the cover that is the epithelium although we tend to say mucosa or interchangeably strictly speaking it's wrong the vocal fold it's the covering is the epithelium and the so-called ring case space which is the superficial layer of the lamina propria okay. so that is called as the cover right there on top okay. which as you see in this time the thickness is 0 0.05 and 0.3 to 0.5. You can add that and have less than uh, or barely 0.5 millimeters uh, thickness, followed by about one millimeter of the middle layer, which forms the vocal ligament. Okay, so body and cover. And what's so fascinating about this? So the body does its work, which is basically as we saw, adducting and contracting and sharpening all that. But the beauty of this is that the cover moves independently over the body so vocal folds may be adducting abducting adducting again but when we are ponating this cover moves almost separately a separate entity and very very smoothly over the body and why is that important we'll see uh, in subsequent slides but this is the concept of body cover which uh, described by hirano which revolutionized the anatomy and understanding physiology of the vocal fold Again, another microanatomy. Uh, you have the basement membrane, the anchoring fibers are there, and the collagen fibers, lamina propria. So these are the various uh, structures, important structures within the uh, uh, upper layers, outer layers. And uh, they say that in vocal nodule, the most injury happens the because of the constant uh, friction. The injury happens in basal membrane, uh, basement membrane, with increased deposit of fibro. The increased deposit of fibronectin is what slowly transforms into or becomes vocal uh, nodules. 
the other uh, interesting aspect in this is that has come up in the last few years is that as you know when we are doing a phono surgery you want to uh, very deftly remove a benign focal fold lesion like sister polyp so, so the first usually the epithelial infiltration so just to create a plane but now they say that this epithelial in in infiltration can damage this particular zone it's not good we want each of these micro structures to be uh, anatomically and you know, structurally and functionally uh, doing their work structurally uh, physiology functionally patent so uh, as laryngologists as phono surgeons we want to preserve each and every structure. so they say that uh, some epithelial infiltration can damage this and so is best avoided so this is a uh, uh, video again i hope it plays this just to you know, already uh, diagnosis so so just to show the vocal audio so this, as you all know it, at the junction of the and at the junction of anterior one third and posterior two third that's where the maximum contact friction happens causing the damage of basal membrane and causing the fibronectin vocal nodules okay yeah so uh, the superficial layer uh, the cover part has interstitial fluid which allows wave motion or just just again just sort of can close your eyes and visualize as well, there is something that is uh, a, a cord like structure okay which is stretching at the same time there is movement over the cord like structure so the superficial layer has interstitial fluid which allows this wave like motion so this is so important the wave like motion is happening the next is the intermediate layer which has elastin which allows stretch so you can imagine the cord like section now as a rubber band you know rubber band stretch it stretch it stretch it so usually what would happen if something is stretched and there is something on the stretched thing it would become still or stiff but because there is interstitial fluid between the two layers the superficial layer the wave motion continues happening even when the layer is stretched so now you can imagine that the rubber band is getting stressed but because of the interstitial fluid the wave motion is still happening and now just imagine as the stretch increases what would happen you can just imagine a rubber band being stretched 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 what would happen finally it would snap or break but the deep layer now contains collagen which absorbs the stress and prevents uh, damage of course the vocal fold will not is not going to snap or break like a rubber band but whatever damage can happen is prevented by the deep so you can see the, the beauty of the ultra structure you have the interstitial fluid which allows continuous wave motion however much the vocal cord and why is the vocal fold getting stretched when we speak when you're using different changes we have to stretch our vocal folds so that's why the stretch is happening and the stretch is done on the intermediate level layer where the elastin and the deep layer also has collagen which absorbs the stretch and prevents damage so these other uh, various contents which allow for the various differential functions of the vocal folds now coming to biomechanics of the vocal fold structure so all for all these things to happen you understand there are few parameters for the uh, uh, for the structure so one is mass stiffness viscosity viscoelasticity of these the first two are very very important for to understand the concept of mass and stiffness because again you if you keep in mind that particular table which i showed the action of each muscle so each muscle contracting would affect the first two parameters okay let's get these now so mass so now again the that first statement is so important for you to understand in physiology that you have a certain you know pitch the same as frequencies so the fundamental frequency or f0 is what our voice box larynx produces okay and it is inversely proportional to mass which means that when the mass increases the f0 fundamental frequency it would decrease and when the mass decreases it would increase okay so when you say body of vocal fold which you saw just now the muscle by itself the static mass so suppose nothing is happening in a vocal fold voice box at rest you have a static mass at the moment you start contracting it becomes a vibratory mass which would change and specifically i have put here again the cricothyroid action which has the effect of decreasing the mass if you remember the cricothyroid action if you had, i told you visualize it becoming like a 
knife the vocal fold becoming like a knife so the recursive action is to make it like a knife which means the effective mass is decreased which would mean of course if you go back to first statement the f0 frequency would increase so the effect of cricothyroid action which means is to increase the pitch especially in the fine tuning of high pitch so in different types of normal phonation there is different there are different diglottic configurations which correspondingly varying the vibratory mass and create the effect needed of course of course i should remind you that all of this what you see on the slide is physiology pathology would mean that anything on the vocal fold which change this and produce a change so any mass like thing on the vocal folds like a growth or a polyp would increase the mass and therefore reduce the uh, f0 okay now stiffness the next very very important parameter it is related to vocal fold tension directly effect affects the f0 as, as in mass was inversely proportional while stiffness is directly proportional so as the stiffness increases uh, the frequency would increase the body and cover both control uh, stiffness now again it's a continuation of that previous table uh, just to see the effect of the muscles on both body body and cover together okay so here some things are uh, understandable like you see the action of the lca and pca it stiffens both body and cover that is uh, understandable well again the things in bold the cricothyroid stiffens strongly both the body and cover so you can see the effect of the cricothyroid in helping to increase the pitch of the voice now coming to the body that is the vocalis muscle it stiffens the body but slackens the uh, cover so cover becomes even more movable the wave like motion this helps to increase when the with the action of the vocalis again if you remember that video how it makes the vocal fold blunt so it becomes blunt and the cover is even more wave like movement can happen on the cover so these are the actions of the muscles on the body and cover these are all physiological so we can bring about changes in the pitch and frequency uh, pitch and intensity of the voice now viscosity viscosity is the resistance to tissue deformation it adversely affects subnotic pressure and just to remember not to confuse with viscosity just keep in mind that viscosity is bad for the vocal folds we want always to reduce the viscosity okay because it 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 resists the tissue deformation which we want to happen and the best thing to affect viscosity to reduce viscosity is hydration that's why the importance of hydration we always say hydrate hydrate the golden word for uh, voice care is hydration which reminds me it's time for me to have my this is something we should be tell we should be telling our patients who are voice that <clears throat> always remember to have a bottle of water with you to drink water not as for thirst but to keep yourself hydrated so uh, in between the long talks and speeches yeah so hydration and uh, the increased tension stiffness affects the viscosity uh, dis uh, dis differential okay. so mass and to some extent viscosity but more important to remember is the effect the physiological effect of the muscles on mass and stiffness which help to control the pitch of the voice okay this is something uh, just the picture itself would be sufficient to make the diagnosis just what i wanted to show was the increase in mass portion it would And the diagnosis, of course, is rinky edema. Now, coming to the biomechanics of phonation. So, this is the next important. So, what we have covered till now is the specific uh, things that are happening at the level of the vocal fold as a uh, function of the structure of the vocal fold itself. Now, we come to the biomechanics of phonation. You're, if you're wondering why I've put these musical instruments up, remember there are broadly three types of musical instruments. The wind instruments that is the ones that create music or noise or sound by uh, should not say noise music or sound by the passage of air wind the string instruments which which create music or noise uh, voice by the sound by the plucking of the strings and third of course is the uh, percussion drum which is not considered here 
So the question is, is the larynx a voice box? Is it a wind instrument or a string instrument? So uh, this was a, a question that used to challenge our early anatomists and physiologists who used to, used to work on voice. And slowly, of course, all these questions got resolved, which we'll also try to see. And there's one statement by a famous music, German musician, Richard Wagner, which all laryngologists love to, stay, uh, love to state. Uh, it's a favorite quote of ours, and you all may have heard it, Wagner saying that the, of all the musical instruments, the human voice is the best, the most beautiful, and the most complex to play. Right. So one aspect of it we've already seen, the vocal folds, the beauty of the vocal folds, the ultra structure, how, you know, how complex it is. Okay, so the now story begins at the bottom. When you, in the beginning, I said, this box you consider as a machine, and you need fuel for the machine, or the petrol for the car, as they say, and that is air. And where does the air come from? The air comes from the lungs. We, so the first picture here showing the bellows action. So it's called as the lungs bellows action. We inhale to take in a deep breath and fill our lungs with air. So volume and pressure is related to now uh, the lungs and the subglottic area. The volume and pressure are directly proportional to the forces acting on the respiratory system. So forces acting, of course, would depend on so many things. Our respiratory muscles, the uh, strength, overall strength, so many factors uh, acting on the respiratory system. The volume and pressure would di directly proportional to that. So when our vocal folds are open, the oral, subglottal, alveolar pressures are almost equal. But when the vocal folds close, slowly the alveolar pressure builds up till what is PTP, the phonatory threshold pressure. We'll see about this is reached. So alveolar pressure builds up under the vocal folds. So the first step has happened that is. We have taken a breath, our vocal folds have abducted, we have taken a breath to fill our lungs. And one of the things when you remember of lungs is the vital capacity. Okay. So at initiation of phonation, the lungs fill to approximately 48% of vital capacity. So we have a certain vital capacity. We went to we want to start speaking now. We take in air. So that's the initiation of phonation. The lungs are filled to 48% of vital capacity. And then we start to speak on it, whatever the communication may be. Till the oil capacity falls to 35%, so which means our next breath we take when the oil capacity falls to 35%. So during all this duration, the vocal folds are adducted and phonation is happening. And only when it is 35%, the brain sends the message, enough now, stop speaking, take in, we need air. And the abduction happens and we inhale for our next breath. So something important to understand. 48% to 35%. Now just imagine when you say 48, 30, 35, what is the next thing you would, you would think of or you should think of? How much time does it take for the 48% to become 35%? Now that is the key. So the important variable is pressure controlled by the initial volume. So the initial volume means the air we inhale, the breath we take. So if you take in a full, that's why when you say, again, the other concept of voice care is breathe in, breathe deep. You know, pranayama, one of the things, you know, air exercise. Deeply to fill you. So initial volume is so important. And now next is something that you may not be familiar with. So just uh, remember this particular term that is a checking act, called a checking action of lungs, which means this is related to phonation. Please remember that there is a slow release of air out of the lungs. Okay, which means going back again to the first set of statements, that means the falling of vital capacity from 48 percent to 35 percent happens very slowly. Very slowly, I mean happen in like two or three seconds that is a check and why is it important so just imagine if the fall from let's say five seconds always which means we have to stop speaking invariably after five seconds okay so that should not happen so that would happen over 10 15 20 25 seconds which can be improved upon by trainings okay so but just understand this that concept of checking action of lengths lungs which prolongs the drop from 40 to 35 percent of the oil capacity which allows us to speak for that much duration and to remind you again this is all we're talking of is physiology if there is something abnormal in any of these things all this goes haywire yeah so something that you go haywire so one thing that you could realize that body posture and important body posture and position is so important for the resting volume so the air volume so the way we sit 
that's why one of the things is to you know, sit straight to sit up while taking a breath so if you're sloughed if you are lying down all that would affect the amount of air that we can so when the volume is inadequate the pressure becomes inadequate and then everything is affected that way other thing is that factors affecting lung capacity and respiratory muscle action would affect the phonation now if you remember uh, when you have a person with a voice disorder one of the first things that we evaluate is the maximum phonation duration or time the mpd or mpt so this particular parameter mpd evaluates both the capacity that is the lungs and the phonator which is the voice box so it checks both the machine and the fuel itself to a certain extent of course to be all. but the point to remember is if mpd is reduced you don't just think of a problem in the phonator you also remember the problem could be with the capacitors so somebody has a voice problem mpd is less and you examine the larynx if it appears to be normal then you will start thinking in terms of something wrong with the lungs so that's the importance of the applied physiology of mpd in terms of the role that the lungs play so when you say the lungs play and if you go to the first statement body posture and position there are n number of factors can affect that so entire body then comes into play to control and support the uh, lung action <coughs> this is just the lungs are filling up now filling up like a balloon and you know what happens when the you know, pin has burst the balloon you have the talk sound coming so something like that happens now yeah so this picture again you may be clear with this uh, just so it's one two one two three four going in this order and then five six seven coming like this so you're aware of this I'll, I'll be repeating this again one more uh, yeah so this is goes from up to to follow the up to up to uh, sorry bottom to up so follow the alphabets it's a to g is from bottom to up so what we are seeing here is the air pressure builds under the uh, vocal fold the subglottic pressure till the ptp the phonatory threshold pressure is reached and then the vocal folds burst open and that bursting open is from the inferior to superior the lower lip to upper lip and the closure is also the same lower lip to upper lip and if you look at anterior posterior it opens out from posterior to anterior but close from anterior posterior so realize the importance of posterior glottis for air uh, required so the opening and closing are both from inferior to superior of the vocal fold medial surface edge medial surface and the uh, anterior posterior if you see posterior is given more importance it grows from posterior to anterior and closes from anterior to posterior okay? so this is seen nicely in this picture so this is something to understand this is a little bit of a dramatic picture of that so if i imagine the vocal folds like the two lips the closing and opening is happening from inferior to superior and this happens continuously in the adducted vocal folds as we are speaking okay yeah so this would be shown a normal uh, looking thing this is the this is the so uh, i stroboscope against an upright why stroboscopy is so important in the relation to the stroboscopy is you know is not used in really use a diagnostic mode in any other uh, bodily function why is it here because this the you know the the so called mucosal wave the vibrations happen so rapidly over the epithelium the cover happens so rapidly that the normal human eye cannot follow it whatever however good our scopes may be however good our lighting may be however good the magnification may be our eye cannot follow it so the strobe effect which slows down vibratory motion when the light is falling flashes of light falling on a vibratory object helps to slow down the motion and gives a false of course it's a it's a uh, it's a false uh, image that we're seeing or a false perception that we're seeing of slowing down but it helps to see the slowed down motion of the fast move happening vibration of the vocal folds that's why the importance of stroboscopy and here we saw a normal stroboscopy which shows the smooth action of the epithelial cover over the adducted body so again the steps the initiation of voice to remind you was the first was the prefrontal inspiration phase you decide to speak the brain sends the message the vocal folds abduct we take in air air goes in the lungs builds up the vocal folds adduct that is the primarily the lca first then the subglottic ptp increases and at a certain point it blows apart 
and the blowing apart creates what is called as the vocal note or the f0 the fundamental frequency is produced the phonation happens at that point next thing important to understand is the vibratory cycle which means what happens next after the first vocal note has gone up into the supraryngeal air the vocal folds come snap back actually the word adduction here is strictly speaking wrong because it's still it's adducted only it just snaps back and aerodynamic separation and recoil okay? so that's a vibratory cycle that's happening and this snapping back is mainly due to two phenomena that's a bernoulli phenomenon as you know air passing pulling in the uh, structures and the viscoelastic properties of vocal folds so please remember that all the time that we are phonating the vocal folds are adducted the air is passing through the vibration that is the uh, beautiful wave like motion is continuously happening over the epithelium the cover while the body the vocal folds are adducted and after each air going up it snaps open and then snaps back snap open snaps back and continuously the the epithelial wave like motion is happening at the same time as per a requirement of pitch change the other muscles if you remember the vocalis the thyroid the cricocerid all would act differentially to increase the vibratory mass and the vibratory stiffness of vocal folds which would bring about appropriate changes in the pitch and intensity okay. so this is how the whole thing works out so remember adduction and aerodynamic separation okay so and this part that's why is a if i if you remember what i said in the beginning it's a mechanical aspect it's not voluntary now at all this happening is pure physics pure mechanics okay so just a, again a diagrammatic representation uh, of air coming from down opening up the vocal folds moving up and then moving up creates the f0 and then the traveling wave moves further up and the second picture you are seeing the wave like motion happening over the, the cover epithelium okay. there were many theories before but now the accepted theory is by vandenberg the aerodynamic myoelastic so aerodynamic is simple the same thing that makes the aeroplane fly so aerodynamic so you have the movement of air the rushing air flow of air which moves the vocal folds and then the myoelastic theory myo is muscle and the elastic action of the vocal folds so this now answers the initial question whether it's a vocal a voice box is a air wind or a string instrument so the answer is it's both is a beautiful fascinating combination of both the uh, wind and string instrument aerodynamic myoelastic theory of phonation further studies have been done by hirano and kakita and ingo tiz ingo tiz is somebody whose name was absolutely not be forgotten when you talk of physical bearings because he has done phenomenal work it's uh, a lot of physics also involved in it uh, i just want to put one specific thing which is something very fascinating which you should understand about what is described about what is happening on the vocal folds as we are phonating so there is again as we have seen is loosely bound elastic, elastic tissue right again if you go back to that thing we talk about the body and the cover being sort of separated by loose tissues so that the cover can move very comfortably and easily and smoothly so this loosely bound elastic tissue supports oscillation or vibration and what it says is that we can view this that there are infinite number of masses on the vocal fold the whole entire vocal fold structure the epithelium he has sort of usually also said that it contains of an infinite number of masses each of these producing a large number of vibrations is possible over the vocal folds as we are phonating these are all the fascinating work done by ingo tidze in physiology of the voice so this is the transducer action of the larynx the transducer action is something that we hear of also in the physiology of hearing if you remember cochlea that the transformation of one form of energy to another so cochlea it is from mechanical to electrical here the vocal folds similarly do a transducer action what is it the vibration of the vocal folds converts the direct current airflow is coming from down so from lungs trachea subglottis the direct current airflow is converted into a alternating current airflow and hence the aerodynamic energy associated with the direct current airflow is converted to acoustic energy of the alternate current airflow so there you have the sound being produced so what was air has now become sound your f0 the fundamental frequency so that is the transducer action of larynx which finally produces uh, the basic human sound and these are all the requirements for normal phonation from all the talk till now this would be obvious you need a good lungs functioning properly good uh, muscle body basically good body and cover of the vocal folds 
Now, the, when you say pitch, so the frequency of the, our voice, pitch is regulated by four parameters. Again, we have seen this mass, both static and vibratory, and length of the vocal fold, which is inversely proportional. So, the pitch increases when the mass or length reduces, and the tension subglottic pressure which is directly proportional. So, when tension of the vocal fold increases, the pitch increases. So, again, this is important to remember the mass and length inversely proportionally affects the pitch, and the tension of the vocal fold and the subglottic pressure directly affects the uh, pitch. Intensity uh, at low pitch, it's controlled by glottic resistance from the, that is the vocal force tightening controls the intensity. But at very high pitch, because the when high pitch, remember the vocal cords become like knives. Okay, again the knife I'm analogy I'm giving you so to remember the sharp edge, but also becomes very stiff and can't do much. So then it's controlled by the flow of the exhaled air. Okay, which means if we want a high pitch and a high intensity, we really have to take in a full breath and then uh, use a voice. Okay. Parameters regulating vocal fold vibratory pattern, physiologic is neuromuscular control, the respiratory muscles produce expiratory force, the laryngeal muscles, we have already seen all these things, the position, the shape, size, the viscosity, all are important. And then the last part which we will see in our subsequent slides, articulatory muscles for the state of the vocal tract. Okay, there is always noise. Okay, So noise something that is unwanted when in electricity there is noise, electrical noise, anywhere there is noise. So in phonation, all physiologic phonation will have a certain small amount of noise. This is due to the two main factors causing noise are air escape. So there's always some little bit of air escaping between the vocal cords and irregular vibration. But pathology would increase the air escape and irregular vibration. And I'm just, I think, showing two common conditions or at least one. This is the common condition causing an air. What is it? A unilateral vocal policy which causes the second part of the diagnosis would be obvious in the picture itself it's so the production doesn't happen fully and so air leak so these are two conditions air leak this concept of vocal registers uh, so the way we speak so the most common is Model, what's called as a model or chest register or head register. It's the commonest one. The F0 range here is 100 to 300. The vocal folds are completely nicely adducted, just about nicely closed, and we speak in that way. Uh, then there is the pulse, or what is called as the glottal fry, creaky voice. It's called as the, uh, the one of the books mentions as the I am sick voice. So you were trying to convey the message maybe over the phone that you are sick and weak. So the voice that you use for that is called as the pulse register. The, F0 drops to 20 to 60 and you have a long closed phase. You're, you're basically creating a voice through a long closed phase of the vocal fold. And then you have the loft or the falsetto or the very high pitch, 300 to right up to 1000. Again, that knife-like uh, analogy, uh, you have the vocal folds which becomes elongated, thin uh, and knife-like, knife-like edge, which means you basically, you know, you have taken a full breath and you're correct the right very fully, create the falsetto. What is the importance of when you Evaluating voice, especially stroboscopy, uh, you should check the uh, vocal fold in all these uh, registers. So you should make the for a patient hit his normal voice, down to the pulse of the low base and the high, and then glide back and forth. So that you can see all these uh, phases of the vocal fold. Uh, by <coughs> Optimal pitch is the most efficient frequency vibration for a given. Be there. But habitual pitch is what we commonly scenario would be where match or habitual pitch is our optimal pitch. And if you are a professional voice or if you are a singer or something, the attempt would be to match these two. Okay? So your optimal pitch should match the habitual pitch. Normally, the pitch range usually spans two octaves. Octave is basically, if you remember the physics, it's a doubling. So 250, 500 is an octave of 250. 500, the next octave is 1000 hertz. So normally you read in two octaves, you will be reading the pitch increased by vocal range. Okay? So optimal pitch, habitual pitch, and two octaves. So now we come to the next part. So we have sort of finished what happens at the larynx voice box level. So phonation is done. Now, so what happens at phonation? Uh, a very basic voice is produced, which is not really Human, no? it is just it's just a voice, it's just a sound that's produced. 
and it would be the same for all individuals no all humanity just activate the vocal folds and the aerodynamic myoelastic action creating phonation would create a common sort of sound that becoming speech is the next fascinating thing as somebody has said the book says speech is the speech is the most complex sequential motor task performed by humans the anatomy of speech so we know that it starts from the lungs the capacitor then the phonator and then we have the other two things that is the resonators and the articulators we see through this so phonation cr creates the produces the fundamental vibratory sound which has a certain pitch frequency and a certain loudness or intensity is not particularly human and not particularly identifiable now what the missing piece is the timber somebody has called as the color of the voice so timber is then what tells us that it's mitha bachan who is speaking or it's you know i'm from kerala so yeshudas who is singing or lata mangeshkar who is singing you know, so the timber of the voice is what gives the identity and what all creates the timber uh, yeah so this is something the investigators found that it takes about duration of about 60 milliseconds to recognize a timber tone any tone shorter than film 4 milliseconds we would perceive as a tone and other things yeah. so so next two things we remember in speech is the resonant articulation which converts the fundamental frequency into the human individual voice and speech so resonance we describe the process by which the product of phonation is enhanced in timbre and or intensity in the air filled cavity through which it passes on its way to the outside air yeah so this actually it's a, a horizontal picture of convert i've just sort of rotated into vertical just to give an idea of the how it happens in human beings so what is happening below you see the word fundamental and what is happening about is basically the basic diagram of the uh, second the overtones and the increase in frequency okay so something similar not exactly what's happening but just to give the concept of resonance as the fundamental frequency produced at the level of vocal folds moves up into the supraglottis then the hypopharynx oropharynx and up oral cavity the uh, change happens in frequency so overtones are produced and these slowly and with the resonation happening in the air filled chambers create start to create the individual voice now so now when it passes through the entire so called vocal tract of which we'll see a picture you have the beginnings of the individual human voice so resonance so air in air in the entire supralaryngeal tract acts as a resonant cavity and you know what happens when it goes wrong so oral nasal balance is important for a good voice so something which is too oral or too nasal is bad we call it a dysfunction of the resonators and technical term of course you know medical term is rhinolalia we have hypo or hypernasality which are perceived to be bad voice now the next important concept is articulation as uh just one day it's not really a definition it's a configuration of vocal tract resulting from the position of the mobile organs of the vocal tract related to the other parts of vocal tract you know what is vocal tract we'll see that so this is another picture so we know uh, that these are all the articulators tongue palate etc and if you remember uh, the indian the index script we have that barakad you know kacha tatha pa so all our these things are based on that kacha tatha pa and if you remember if you see that here it goes in the reverse order it's 5 4 3 2 1 so ka is post alveolar for the alveolar ka cha ta ta pa pa is bilabial and so on so all these of course this all these would vary hugely between uh, not only individual but language to language so from parts of the world it all these would vary unlike what is happening at the level of phonation which is common to entire humanity human beings what happens above that especially this particular picture what you see in this picture would differ hugely between not only individuals but from language to language in different parts of the world and in general one one very generic thing would be what is called so called the vowels are the uh, sounds in which there is no obstruction of the air flow as it passes from the air to the lips okay, so no obstruction okay, so entire it passes resonating chambers articulators do not do anything and vowel is produced but consonants are where there is a definite obstruction by one or more articulators any one of these to varying levels to produce the specific consonant as per the requirement of the language so just a very basic about vowel and consonant so what is the theory of speech that source filter theory which means that speech is the product of passage of acoustic source which was the vibrating vocal folds the most common acoustic source we would think of as the tuning fork so by vocal folds you could think of very very rough crude uh, similarity of analogy of tuning fork so the vibrating fo vocal folds like a tuning fork becomes the acoustic source and then this source the sound produced passes to the filter of the 
vocal tract to produce speech. And what is the vocal tract? So this is a uh, very, very uh, detailed descriptive uh, concept as a concept of vocal tract per se. <clears throat> so keep this picture in mind and just go for the description. So vocal tract, the total dimension is distance from the plane of vocal folds to anterior lips, which can be broken down into the vertical and the horizontal. So vertical is from the vocal folds to the posterior nasal spine. While horizontal is distance from the anterior to the pharyngeal wall. So we have the VTV and the VTH to uh, form parts of the vocal tract. And this consists of movable and fixed components, of course, as you can imagine, tongue, which is the biggest mobile component, and the palate. And you have, have the posterior pharyngeal wall and the nasal spine, which are all the immobile components. So the huge flexibility. So when these things move, it changes not only, of course, it is for articulation purpose, but at the same time, it also changes the resonance. And then you have, as we say, as I said, the individual human voice and speech. So structural function change the articulators is what is called as disarticulation or in very uh, rough term what we call as an unclear speech which is different from coarseness. Theories of speech production this is uh, again not commonly found in our laryngology books it's more from the uh, audiology speech pathology section so there are many theories of they say it's theory as we as a child learn speech the various feedback it's based feedback mechanisms so auditory information tactile info external sources all give feedback to help in speech development and there is this new concept what they call as the diva directions into velocities of articulation model which says that auditory feedback and feed forward are the main inputs of articulation so what is feed forward feed forward is something that comes from the brain so everything else feedback is from the other sources what we hear what we see the what we feel all those are the feedback but feed forward means that something sent from the brain itself improves or affects the articulation. Okay? And this is supposed to be uh, done by the mirror neurons in cerebrum. These are all very new things that's happening in the last two decades. And this has implications that treatment. So this is more for the speech pathologist. When you speech therapy, all these areas are addressed in uh, conditions which affect neurological conditions which cause serious speech disorders. Okay? So this is the Diva theory the concept of feed forward by mirror neurons and cerebrum. So already I've covered a few things applied physiology where in respect to slide, but just a quick look at some pathologies. So I my charger on. Yeah. So uh, change of voice. Uh, this is something that I want all post guys to just keep in mind. This is something that I like to stress on that when somebody says when a patient, when your patient says I have voice change. So don't just jump into thinking that it's dysphonia because change of voice would mean problem anywhere. Problem in the lungs, problem in the throat, in the resonators, in the articulators. Anything would be change of voice in the layman's term, the way the patient or the bystander patient says. So when you hear change of voice, don't just assume it is a phonatory problem or that it's hoarseness. So it should be very clear in your history taking to clarify whether the change of voice is actually a change in the voice per se or in the tone or of course then you start listening to the patient and you can form your conclusion from that and next thing again this is the very last part treatment which i'm not covering but just generally please don't use these terms interchangeably voice therapy and speech therapy are separate what happens when you do something for the larynx any problem in the larynx whether it is vocal nodules or sulcus or united vocal fold palsy when you send the patient the voice pathologists they are doing a voice therapy but when there is articulation problems neurological problems then it is speech therapy so just two things to okay this is, looks a crowded slide but just very quickly to remember then when there are neurological dysphonia there are very different categories so a flaccid dysarthria causes what is called as a consistent dysphonia while a multiple sclerosis causes what is called as a spastic dysphonia then uh, this particular group of which it's supposed to be the commonest that is the ataxia, focal dysphonia and then spasmodic which is actually not so common causes a fluctuant dysphonia. Then the far less common palatophenyl myoclonus or tremor causes a rhythmically fluctuant dysphonia and then there is total sort of loss of volitional control that is critical injury. So these are various types of classes of neurogenic dysphonia, consistent type, spastic type, non-rhythmic fluctuant type, rhythmic fluctuant type, loss of control. So 
the importance here is just by taking the history and listening to the voice and speech you could sort of even though it's not a neurologist you could still form a uh, uh, diagnosis like this pardon me i'll just Uh, then patients with bulbar palsy, they report that due to partial brainstem injury and disconnect palsy, they report their vocalization do not correspond to the so patient would say that I'm feeling happy, but when my voice comes out, it sounds like a crying voice or some such thing. So these are the uh, different things that happen in a neurogenic voice problem. Uh, if there are extra pyramidal lesions, there is no paralysis of voluntary movements, but more of tremor, etc. And the clinical pathal correlation is for dystonia, Parkinson's, etc., where there's a different types of voice problems, uh, speech problems, and so this would need speech therapy. Now, what is this picture showing? This, is, of course, a very basic picture from your first year uh, physiology. That is what is happening at the neuromuscular junction, acetyl colon is released. And why am I showing it here? Because of that one fascinating condition, which is not so common, but really very fascinating, that is the spasmodic dysphonia, which again, I want to remind PGs, please don't confuse this with muscle tension dysphonia, which is something that's purely happening at the uh, laryngeal level, something purely to do with the muscles of the musculature of the larynx. This is something rare, a fascinating condition, spasmodic dysphonia, and what are the features? It is, there is no definite anatomic site of, definitely not the larynx. The problem is definitely not at the larynx. We know it's neuro neurological, but affecting the larynx. But what exactly? Not sure. There are uh, studies now showing that it could be the basal ganglia. And it's a, it's a very fascinating to understand. It's a task-specific dystonia. That is, these people have problem mainly in normal conversation, telephonic conversation, and stressful conversation. But the moment they are laughing or crying or singing for that matter, it improves. So it's a fascinating condition, rare. But the physiology is fascinating. And then the fact that you can control it by using botulinum because it acts at the level of the neuromuscular uh, uh, level, which is you are using the understanding of physiology to treat this condition. Okay, so four things capacitive is lungs or chest, then the phonation uh, larynx I put in red because One part is not repairable. Make the best use of the and so angel healthy uh, darings and problems again.
good vocal habit the silver most Sir, only question, sir. Uh, actually, in the last three minutes of your lecture, we could not uh, hear. Uh, there was some uh, internet connectivity issue on your side. Okay, I was not aware. So, from which part? I don't mind. Just tell me which just part the, from where. If you can just specifically say. Just the last three slides, sir. So last three slides. Okay, I mean the last slide was just a thank you slide. So uh, what I was saying in those last three slides was actually about the taking care of our uh, voice, which means taking care of the entire body because body affects the lungs and respiration. So we take care of entire body. Uh, then the larynx. So taking care of the larynx, which means ensuring that we take care of the anatomy and physiology of the larynx. And when we say physiology, we know what we mean that it should be. Well hydrated, there should be good air. We there is a statement that we say that the only two medicines for the larynx are air and water. And now after listening to this uh, to this talk, you would have realized the importance of air and water. Air is basically because to build up the volume, good volume in the lungs to give good pressure and to have a good voice. And uh, water is because hydration reduces the viscosity to help the whole vibration of the vocal folds to happen. Uh, and the other thing that I mentioned in that in those slides was all the other things that you would take care of. That is uh, again same thing. Is just uh, to ensure the good functioning of the uh, voice box. That that's it. Nothing. Nothing much. Yeah, I could see a question. Is it how to assess MTP? Should I answer that? Uh, can I take that? I saw on the chat. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely love this question. I am I'm so happy that a PG has asked this because it's something very important. Uh, and why is it important? Because one thing it is a screening test for voice. So you have your the first thing is you listen to the persons. You you take the history, of course, and as you're taking the history, you hear the voice. With that itself, you start to form a conclusion whether it is truly hoarseness as the breath. If it's hoarseness as a breathy or harsh voice, or whether it's a resonating or articulative problem. And the next thing before you even Check the larynx or do a laryngoscopy. It's the MPP, and that is important because, as I said, it's a screening test, screening for both the capacitor and the phonator. So, you, what do you do? You tell the patient. Actually, would have to demonstrate because it sounds easy, but it's not easy. Many patients do it incorrectly at the first try. You take a deep aspiration, you take a deep breath, and phonate. And R or E R works better. So. Uh, so how long? So uh, believe me, it's uh, they always get it wrong few times. So the usual first first thing they would they don't take a phonator. So that's wrong. It should be inhaled through the nose only, mouth closed, neck relaxed. So the inhalation should be only through the nose. That's very important. Till they feel that the chest and abdomen are full. That's what you see. Actually, feel your chest full. And if you correlate with the physiology, what are we doing? We are ensuring the vital capacity increases. So that because if you remember, we have the 48% to 35% is the gap that we have of our vital capacity for phonation. So take a full breath through the nose till you feel the chest and lung expanding fully. And then 
start immediately. Some people want to do is take, take a full breath and then let out somewhere. So that's gone. So that, that part is gone. So they should start immediately and open the mouth and start saying ah without training. So they should not try to, once you tell them that you're checking the time, some of them try to start forcing ah as if we prolong the time. So that should not be there. Neither should very through close lips. Some of them will do. Uh, so all those are wrong. The mouth should be relaxed normally for their whatever the configuration is and just say ah in a very normal tone along with the releasing of the air. So take a full breath correctly nasally till you feel your chest and abdomen expanding fully and then immediately start saying ah raising the air till it stops and then you are recording it in seconds. Uh, although textbooks say 15 to 20 seconds is the normal, uh, we may not always get that in our uh, Indian population. Again, uh, why is that? Physiology, very simple. Lung vital capacity is the, uh, is the answer. So usually 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, etc. is what we get. And the general rule of thumb which I use, many of my colleagues and colleagues may differ. A general, very general rule of thumb is 10 seconds. So if there is something general, wrong with the vocal folds or of course with the lungs in terms of let's say asthma or COPD patient would not be able to cross 10 seconds okay? and very interestingly uh, for you all to understand uh, there's one condition in which you would have an increased uh, MTP although there's a problem with the larynx and that is in spasmal dysphonia and why is that because Vocal cords go into spasm when the patient is phonating, which means it remains there like that, and the patient is able to say ah for a long time. So you have a supra normal MTP in spasmodic dysphonia. But otherwise, in general, of course, this is not a this is not a you won't find in textbook, it's not an absolute thing, but generally 10 seconds. So somebody says he's got a he or she's got a voice problem, and you see the MTP is 11, 12 seconds, you know that okay, maybe it's not nothing much on the vocal folds. Or on the other hand, get a really bad you know, three seconds four seconds then you start to worry and interestingly if it's low and you see the exam the next step you examine the larynx and you see there's nothing wrong with the larynx immediately think of the lungs right you got that it's, it's a good question so i'm happy you asked this because something very important you should get this very correctly sir there's one more oh yeah. <laughs> yeah i saw that the perceptual no, this is a difficult question okay this is a little difficult uh you have to understand that subject component okay uh, 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 so to understand so you know something seems like that that's breathy that very obviously is breathy and the most common cause would be a big phonetry gap which as i showed one thing would be a vocal cord pulse you know one side is fully saying like this and you have a huge air gap other thing would be something like this so sulcus vocalis big sulcus and you have a big area that's a very breathy voice that you can see so that is breathy very easy Arch is anything that is that abnormal, no? all that, anything, any mass lesion would cause a harsh voice. The problem is this, one is it's subjective. So, you know, this is what I told you and you can sort of, sort of uh, under, probably understood it. But the problem is it's one subjective. Second is it's very rare that it's very typical. No, it's not that a uh, unit vocal cord palsy with an air leak happening would have only a breathy voice. It would be probably be true for one or two weeks. After that, slowly, other things start happening. Larynx is so dynamic. So then slowly the compensation starts happening. So either there could be improvement or worsening. So breathiness could come down and hoarseness, the harshness could increase, etc. etc. So it's a little uh, tricky. It's a large amount of subjectivity is there. And for that, the, or the speech pathologists, the voice pathologists, they have their score, what they call the GRBAS and all those things. But it's largely subjective. But in general, breathies would be there. Yes, and how hard that your ear hurts to hear the voice. Okay. Uh, it's of course it's an important question, but the problem is it's, it's a huge topic in itself. So the last two or three slides, the concept of uh, so of vocal hygiene. Uh, so there are so many things actually vocal hygiene. So the one thing would be where you actually give a brief overview of the 
anatomy and physiology to the uh, patient. You know so that it, it sounds little this thing, but you take a miniature class of today's class session for the patient also right, for them to understand the working and uh, doing a scopy, maybe even if not a stroboscopy, just adding a scopy and recording it and showing it to them is so important that this is what is happening and this is what where you are going wrong so that is one important thing then this concept that conveying to the uh, patient that the only two really good medicines for uh, your voice box is air and water which means deep breath always deep breath always full breath do not go out of breath do not speak out of breath okay again remember that 48 percent 35 percent of vocal capacity so vital capacity sorry so your speech happens in that range and so the idea is to prolong that happening for which the important thing is to simple thing is to take a full breath and hydration so air and water so those are the two important things and when we say water we also have to add not to to avoid dehydrating agents so what are dehydrating agents alcohol tea coffee anti-allergic medications these are all uh, uh, these are all dehydrating agents. So to avoid that, so when when you say hydration, take a lot of water and also avoid dehydrating agents. Uh, then you tell them the concept of basically avoiding voice abuse. So voice abuse is basically overuse, misuse, all those are various forms of voice abuse where we go beyond our breath capacity, where we scream too much, where we whisper too much, all that is voice training. Some people have the wrong concept when you say voice rest or voice training. They start whispering. The whispering is also a strain on the vocal fold. So avoid whispering. So all these are uh, the concept of vocal hygiene. So as I said, that is a huge chapter. Said, but these are the basic things. Explain the patient to the patient in brief about how the voice box functions, the importance of stressing the importance of air and water, and the basic uh, things to avoid vocal abuse. Yeah, so uh, I saw a few other questions. I think treatment part and all, I think uh, maybe the out of uh, remit of this talk, I'm sure there will be a lot of talk coming up later specifically dedicated to uh, management aspects. So uh, I saw something about puberphonia, phonia, all that. So those are puberphonia or very easily treated uh, by uh, the uh, voice pathologists. Uh, I saw something about aphonia also. So again, aphonia, in, at least in my experience, I think most of the time aphonia is uh, functional. So that again, a little bit of counseling and voice therapy would treat it. Yeah, so. Uh, we actually have a actual disorders of larynx. Hopefully we'll be covered in all these topics in that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. This is sort of just the beginning of the, wonderful journey through the larynx and voice. So I hope I've given a good first step. That is just my uh, wish that I've given a first step to the whole wonderful world of larynx and voice. Thank you, sir. It was indeed one the greatest lecture I've been witnessing. And uh, we are very, really happy that you have started on a good note. Uh, I'm sure uh, all the audience agree with me. And we have a lot of uh, congratulatory messages in the chat section too. Some are saying excellent presentation, one of the best and detailed classes. So, sir, as promised, uh, I will leave you by 9 p.m. So, 8.15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. And we are really honored to have you on our platform. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, it, is, it has been my honor. Because two things, because I, I, as I told you, I was saying in the beginning, all those brochures, it was, I was like really impressed and I felt honored myself. I am amongst all these people. <laughs> Second thing is, I am thankful, of course, I would like to thank Dr. Vidya that I think who suggested my name to you. Yes, I have a topic straight from my heart, you know, voice and the physiology. So, thanks for the opportunity. And knowing that, uh, just for my academic interest, uh, Sriyarsha, how many PGs have been here? Uh, we had around 150 at the peak. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, that, that's really fascinating and happy for me. Too. Thank you, sir, and uh, have a good day. Yeah, yeah.